I'm John T, and I'm an astronomer here at USQ in Toowoomba. And what I'll be telling you about in this third and final presentation on our solar system are the final stages of planet formation that have gone on right until the current day. The final sweeping up of debris that continues every night, every day of every year, and will continue for the foreseeable future at an ever decreasing rate. What you're seeing here is an example of one of these events where we sweep up debris. This is possibly the most famous impact crater on the planet. It's something called Meteor Crater, or more correctly, the Barringer Impact Crater in the Arizona desert. Imagine we're stood on this limb here at the edge of the crater looking out across it. The far wall that you can see in the distance is about 1,400 meters away. The crater base, the bottom where those buildings are, is about 200 meters below you. It's a big hole in the ground, or it's big in in terms of what you and I would expect to see walking around in the middle of the desert. However, as craters go, it's actually a fairly small one. It's also a very recent one. As you'll see later on, this crater was formed within the last 50,000 years. If you want to see an example of a really big crater, however, this is something you can see with Google Earth. If you look at the northeastern part of Canada and start zooming in there, you'll very quickly see this very circular lake. This is a crater called Manicoagan. It's a couple of hundred million years old, much older than Meteor Crater. It's also much bigger. The lake you're seeing there is a very central part of the crater, the part that's still easy to see hundreds of millions of years after this thing was formed. That's 60 kilometers across. It's huge. It's also a good example, however, of how craters are not purely a bad thing, how impacts do not necessarily solely threaten life. They can also be a very beneficial thing for us here today. If you look at the south end of the crater, you can see a river weaving out of the crater. That river has been dammed by the Canadians and produces vast amounts of hydroelectric power, using the crater as a reservoir, as this huge head of water, which provides a significant fraction of Canada's power. A very nice illustration that impacts are not necessarily all bad. If we want to get a feeling, however, for how often the Earth's been pummeled, we need to look at the whole planet. Now, this figure is somewhat out of date. I've been unable to find an updated version. This is 10 or 15 years old. But it shows you all of the impact craters that are known on Earth as of about a decade ago. And it tells us a huge amount of information. Unfortunately, what it doesn't really tell us is about how often the Earth is hit. Instead, it tells us a lot of things about the processes that go on on Earth and also the way that we do science. The, one of the first things I always notice when I look at this is to look at Scandinavia, northern Europe. What you can see there is that in a small area, there are a huge number of very small impact craters. That's not telling you that the Norse god Thor is angry, that he's throwing his hammer around, that this is a bad place to go on holiday. Rather, it's telling you something about how we do science. In order to find these craters, up until the era of Google Earth, which has changed things a little bit, but previously, in order to find craters, you had to get funding, you had to go on trips, you had to explore the wilderness looking for holes in the ground, and then meticulously research them to make sure they're actually impact craters, rather than a hole somebody's dug, or a volcanic remnant, something like this. If you're trying to get funding from the government, it's much easier to get funding to go in your local environment than it is to go to Mauritius, or to go to the Seychelles. To go to these luxurious holiday locations you'd really like to do science is more expensive, so you're more likely to get funding to look locally. And what the large number of craters you're seeing in Scandinavia is telling you is that there was a very enthusiastic group of scientists there looking for impact craters, got funding to go look in their local area, and they found loads of them. Let's look now at the Brazilian rainforest in South America. In the Brazilian rainforest, there are very few craters. This is partly the result of how we do science. It's very hard to get funding to go to the Brazilian rainforest when you can instead just go to your local environment. But it's also telling you something about the weathering that goes on. It's very hard to find craters in the middle of a forest. And because it's a rainforest, there's a lot of weather, a lot of rainfall, getting rid of the evidence of craters. If you look at Canada, where we have the Manicoagan impact, you'll see there are quite a few large craters there. The crust in Canada, in that area of Canada, is some of the oldest crust on the planet that hasn't been resurfaced. And so the biggest craters have accumulated there and not been wiped away, so we get more craters. But the most interesting thing on here for me is the lack of craters at the bottom of the oceans. 70% of our planet is covered by water. 
and yet we can only see three or four craters at the ocean bottom. Few factors going on here, one of which is that it's actually very hard to see through six kilometres depth of water to see what's on the bottom. But the other thing is a superhero trick. So you've seen films with James Bond running away from bad guys, and the bad guys have forgotten how to shoot straight, and bullets are flying everywhere, totally missing James Bond. He runs along, sees a fish pond, and dives into it, and you get this beautiful slow motion picture of the person diving into the water and bullets zipping into the water and then stopping and floating down. And you see this and you think, this is stupid, this makes no sense, bullets don't work this way, it must be the movie taking creative license. Well, there's actually some truth in it. I knew someone who was doing a fantastic piece of PhD research in the UK, and her entire experiment was to use a big gun, and when I say a big gun, something large enough to fill the room that you're in twice over, 10 metres long. And the whole point of this gun was to fire tiny ball bearings at a speed of five kilometres per second into targets and look at what kind of craters they made. And her PhD involved putting a layer of water in front of the target and seeing how much water you needed to stop any crater being formed. What she found was really remarkable. If you have a layer of water that is slightly deeper than the size of your projectile, no crater is formed at the bottom of the ocean. So the main reason we have no craters on the ocean bottom is not because we can't see through it, but simply because the oceans are deep enough to cushion any impact that is from an object smaller than the depth of the ocean. Now, the average depth of the ocean is six kilometres, and so any impact of smaller than six kilometres is very unlikely to leave a crater at the bottom of the ocean. That doesn't, however, mean it would do no damage. Instead of digging a crater in the rock at the bottom of the ocean, it would dig a 100 kilometre wide crater out of the ocean, displace water, create tsunamis. Not tiny tsunamis like we get from earthquakes, but tsunamis kilometres tall, travelling faster than the speed of sound, that would level everything in their path. Would be very catastrophic for the world around that impact site, but 10,000 years, 100,000 years down the line, there'd be no evidence that this happened, other than places where the land had been scoured clean by these dramatic waves. If we want to get a real feel for how often the Earth's been impacted, we need to move on and look elsewhere. We need to look at our nearest neighbour. This is the Moon, and this actually is the Moon, unlike earlier on. When we look at the Moon, we see craters, we see hundreds, thousands, millions of craters. We see craters on top of other craters. And you can see this pot-marked face of the Moon that's kept permanently towards the Earth. But we can also see that impacts are a real ongoing current concern. If you look on the lower part of the Moon here, you can see one crater with a spray of white lines radiating out from it. That's called a ray crater. And that's a crater that was formed relatively recently in the geological past. And the reason we know that is down to those white lines splashing out across the Moon's surface. The surface of the Moon is unprotected. There's no atmosphere to prevent the material flung out from the Sun, cosmic rays bombarding the rocks on the surface. And that bombardment gradually weathers the surface and makes it get darker and darker, leading to the dark side of the Moon that we see, the dark colour of the Moon. The Moon's actually not much more reflective than your average blackboard. It's just really big, that's why we can see it. But this weathering that darkens the surface only darkens about the top metre depth. All the material gets absorbed by the first metre of rock and everything underneath remains pristine, unaltered. If you then smack into the Moon with an impactor, you'll dig up and flung material out from the site of the impact, digging down to this fresh material, splashing it across the Moon's surface, creating these white splash marks that sit on the surface of the Moon, the rays in the ray crater. Over time, the weathering happens and darkens them back to the colour of the background. So the fact we can still see them means they haven't been weathered away, which means this impact must have happened relatively recently. And by relatively recently here, we're talking one million years, 10 million years. Sounds a long time, but it's a much shorter period of time than the 4,000 million years since the Earth-Moon system formed. And it's not just on the Moon that we see huge numbers of craters. This is one of my favourite astronomy pictures that's ever been taken. It was taken by one of the satellites we have orbiting Mars. Now, that satellite has the most exquisite high-powered cameras you can imagine. To put it in perspective how good these cameras are, if this satellite was in orbit around the Earth, we would never see the pictures because the US military would censor them and prevent us from ever seeing them. It's comparable to the spy satellites that aren't officially out there that we don't know exist but clearly do. This shows you Victoria Crater. It's about 200 metres across, the large thing with the sand dunes in the middle. Very weathered, Mars has an atmosphere, 
edging, nibbling away at this crater. But in this small field, maybe 400 meters across in this image, you can see five, 10, 20 craters. You can also see here, just highlighted, the thing that makes this particularly remarkable to me. This small speck is one of the Mars rovers, something the size of a golf cart that we've landed on the surface of Mars. If you get the high resolution version of this photo, you can actually see the tracks that the rover has left behind driving around the outskirts of this crater. And for me, this is truly remarkable. This is a photo of something we've landed on another planet from something we have orbiting another planet that has a camera that is so good that if you were lying in your back garden, it could see you. That's really amazing. But this is the surface of Mars, it's pocked and bombarded. Now, these impacts are ongoing. They're the sweeping up of debris. And as you've seen, they can make very big craters. We saw Manicowagon, the central part of which is 60 kilometers across. Possibly the most famous impact, the one you're most likely to have heard of, is the one that's created this artist's impression of a crater. This is what an artist imagines you would see if you were at the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. About 64 million years ago, you see a crater filled with ocean, a couple of hundred kilometers across, big cliffs. The next image I'll show you is what an artist thinks this would have looked like 65 million years ago. That's right, it's the death of the dinosaurs. It's one of the great fairy stories, one of the great theories that we've got kicking around at the minute. The biggest, most impressive beast to ever roam the Earth, the dinosaurs, killed by falling space rock. It's a fabulous newspaper headline. It's also a great example of how science is never quite as clear-cut as even scientists sometimes portray. If you ask astronomers what the main reason, the proximate reason that the dinosaurs were wiped out was, they'd argue it was this impact. We've got a smoking gun, we've got the Shiksalub crater, 300 kilometers across. A giant rock, 10 or 20 kilometers across, smashed into the earth, created a nuclear winter. Dug up a huge amount of carbon dioxide from the rocks it impacted, which meant when the nuclear winter en ended, there was a huge period of global warming. Everything that had survived was cooked. Dinosaurs died, really straightforward. If you talk to geologists, however, you find out that this isn't the whole story. The dinosaurs were already in decline. There's an area in India called the Deccan Traps that are the largest flood basalt outpourings to have occurred on the Earth in the last 2,000 million years. To put it into perspective, it's an area the size of Europe, comparable to an area the size of New South Wales, buried a kilometre deep in basalt lava. These horrific hell-like conditions, volcanoes erupting, spewing noxious gas into the air, were weakening, killing the dinosaurs off before this impact happened. And probably the true story is that it was a combination of various factors that finished the dinosaurs, but the final nail in the coffin was the collision of the giant rock that created the Shiksalub crater and put the final death knell for the dinosaurs. And also helped to encourage the rise of the mammals, and it's probably partially the reason that we're here today having this discussion. But impacts are not a historical thing. 1908, this again is an artist's impression, but in 1908, there was the largest impact on Earth in recorded history, in a very isolated part of Siberia called Tunguska. That impact did this. It leveled an area the size of Greater Sydney, an area the size of Greater London. Over 2,000 square kilometers of forest, trees were knocked down, blown outwards, all laying down in the same direction, radiating out from this blast point. What we think happened was that a fragment of a comet, a dirty snowball, entered the Earth's atmosphere above Siberia, got deeper and deeper and deeper until 10 or 20 kilometers up, it exploded in a terminal air burst, sending a huge shockwave out into the ground below, flattening the trees, killing the reindeer. Now we're very fortunate this is such an isolated, uninhabited area. We don't think anybody was killed by this, although records are a bit patchy. To give you an idea of the scale of the impact, however, a third of a world away, people were able to read newspapers at night from the glow. So here's Sydney. Let's say we don't like Sydney and we want to recreate the Tunguska impact. What would we see? Now let's say that we send this in and we send it in at the middle of Sydney, around Auburn. How big an area would the Tunguska impactor have leveled? In other words, those of you who've ever been to Sydney, it's about an hour and a half drive from Bondi Beach to the Blue Mountains. It's a long way. If the impact happened 
over the centre of Sydney here, somewhere out in the western suburbs a bit, Auburn. If you were surfing in Bondi, you'd have been knocked off your board and probably killed. If you were at the foot of the Blue Mountains, you'd have been knocked over and probably killed. It's a huge area to be impacted, but because it didn't leave a crater, if this had happened a thousand years ago, we probably wouldn't know anything about it. We only know about it because of modern communication and the fact that that area of trees was levelled. If you came back once the trees have regrown, there'd be no evidence for this impact at all. And yet it's big enough to level a city. We think an impact of this scale probably happens about every thousand years, but you don't need to worry too much because cities actually occupy a very tiny fraction of the Earth's surface. So the odds of a collision like this happening above a city are relatively small. But it isn't the only impact to have happened recently. We always thought that these impacts happened once in a blue moon and the odds of one happening over a city were very limited. And then this happened. This is a photograph taken in February 2013 in the Russian city of Chelyabinsk. It's the middle of winter in the Northern Hemisphere and Chelyabinsk is quite far north. So even though this is 20 past nine in the morning, it's dusk, near sunrise. People driving to work. And as you'll see in this animation, something spectacular, something really incredible happened. The reason this is so well documented, incidentally, is down to the Russian society, the Russian culture. Most people driving in Russia keep a dashboard webcam and record every journey they make in order that if they crash into someone, they can prove it was the other person's fault. It's an insurance thing. But what it means for us as scientists is we have this exquisite collection of videos of this event happening. So you see a guy here driving along the road, driving on his way into work. It's absolutely fantastic. Normal morning commute, it's dawn, sun hasn't risen yet driving towards the sunrise. Turns off going down towards a little side street and then in the sky something bright starts to shine. Burning up in the atmosphere, getting brighter and brighter. So bright it reflects off the road, so bright it's brighter than the midday sun. Dazzling. Incredible. What's most startling to me is that he just keeps driving. If this happened and I was driving, I'd be turning around. I'd be driving the other way, I'd be panicking. But no, quite cool Russian guy, just carried on with his life. Now, as you can see, that was brighter than the midday sun. There's incredible footage on YouTube of shadows reacting to this as this thing flies across the sky. Shadows in the town square swinging from left to right as the brightest thing in the sky moves. Out shone the midday sun. People stepped outside and over the next few minutes, they looked out and they saw a giant smoke train, as you see at the top of this video here, before I start playing it, the evidence of this smoke train. Now, Chelyabinsk is a big city. I'd never heard of it before. Over a million people witnessed this and heard what you're about to hear. Now, before I let this video run, I should apologise. I don't speak Russian, but I have a suspicion that those of you who do may hear some slightly unsavoury words. I have apologies for this, but as you hear the video, you'll at least understand why people were a little startled. So we'll just let this roll. I won't play the whole video. Just stepped out from the office looking at the remains of this explosion in the sky. What you're seeing are windows shattered by the shockwave from this explosion. The loud bang was that shockwave finally reaching us. This explosion was 30 or 40 kilometers away. So the sound took several minutes to reach from the explosion to the ground. The ongoing rumbles, the ongoing bangs you're hearing in the background aren't gunshots. Those are echoes of the shockwave. Actual little shocks happening. But look at the damage that was dealt. All of the buildings across Chalyabin were hit by the shockwave. 1,500 people were injured. Nobody was killed, remarkably, but a huge number of people were injured by falling glass. Buildings were damaged, roughly 7,000. We don't know exactly because people being opportunistic, a large number of buildings were damaged shortly after this by sledgehammers by people who'd seen the other damage and wanted to claim their insurance money. But this is a real reminder of how suddenly these kind of impacts can happen and how much of an ongoing threat they pose to the Earth. So that's the story of the large impacts that are still ongoing today that can leave craters, leave holes in the ground. If you go out on any clear night of the year, though, you can see the smaller end of this. If you stand out under a dark sky and let your eyes acclimate to the darkness, on any night of the year, you should see three or four shooting stars per hour, meteors. Every meteor you see is a grain of dust, grain of sand, left over from the formation of the planets, hitting the top of the Earth's atmosphere and burning up. 
It's another little bit of material added to the Earth, making the Earth grow just a little bit larger. In our solar system, there's a lot more small things and big things, so the larger you go, the less frequently something that size will hit us. Something like the Chelyabinsk impactor maybe only happens every 50 or 100 years, and we were just very fortunate in 2013 that it happened near a city and we got this exquisite footage from which we've learned so much. Bigger impacts like Tunguska, maybe every 1,000 years. On average, we think something one kilometre across, something that would leave a hole 20 kilometres in diameter, probably hits us every few hundred thousand years, and something like the thing that killed the dinosaurs or contributed to that extinction is probably every 30 or 50 million years. The bigger you are, the less of you are floating around there, the less likely you are to hit the Earth, but the more damage you do when you do. Now, people are searching for these objects all the time. They're looking for things that could hit the Earth, trying to find them before they do. And it's a really active area of research for astronomers and will continue for the foreseeable future because you never know when one of these things might swing onto a collision course, having previously never come anywhere near the Earth. Hopefully what I've taught you in these three little modules then is a story of planet formation from the very formation of our sun, through the formation of the planets, through the giant collisions that shaped our solar system, and on to the smaller collisions, the smaller tail, that are going on to the very current day. As we develop our understanding of the planets beyond our solar system, which is something we here at USQ are very heavily involved with, searching for new planets around other stars, these same processes will have shaped those systems. We're now able to find the reservoirs of dust, like the asteroid belt, around those stars in those planetary systems and study the impacts, not in our own solar system, but the impacts that will happen on planets around other stars. And so the future of this field is really exciting. In the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, during your lifetimes, we may be able to identify planets that could host life elsewhere and find out how frequently they're hit by things like the Chelyabinsk impactor. I think that's a really nice place to stop looking to the future. So thank you very much for your attention.